Well, I am happy to introduce again on Bad Faith Podcast, Ralph Nader, uh, who has run multiple times for the Office of the President, for the Green Party, a consumer advocate, and what I and my mother refer to as repeatedly <laughs> as an American hero. Welcome back to the show, Ralph Nader. Thank, Thank you very much, Rihanna. All right, I want to ask you first about an interview that you gave back in September that ruffled some feathers, that caused some consternation. Uh, on the left. In that interview, um, you were asked about the 2024 election and whether or not you would support Joe Biden. And you said that this is how the Washington Post characterizes it at the very least. And I want to get your response. Quote, we are stuck with Biden now, Nader says in his cantankerous way, in a two-party duopoly. If one should be defeated ferociously, the logic is that the other one prevails. I know the difference between fascism and autocracy, and I'll take autocracy any time, Nader said in a recent uh, telephone interview. Fascism is what the GOP is the architect of, and autocracy is what the Democrats are practitioners of, but autocracy leaves an opening. They don't suppress votes. They don't suppress speech. Now, this was interpreted as a kind of a vote blue no matter who argument, and I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that interpretation and whether you feel any differently now after the events of October 7th and the siege on Gaza? Well, I've never supported uh, Biden in the Senate. I didn't support him. He was he was a warmonger. He, he never saw a, a war of empire by the U.S. he didn't like, except Libya. That's where he diverged from Hillary's war in the Libyan chaos, which continues to this day. And he also uh, wanted to ban me from going up on Capitol Hill after 2000. He doesn't understand the various sine qua nons that uh, led to Bush being selected as president by the 5-4 vote of the Supreme Court under Justice Scalia's political maneuver that cut off the recall by the Florida Supreme Court, the re recount, rather. So uh, I have severe reservations about Biden. What I was saying is, that uh, if you're confronted with a choice between fascism that suppresses the vote, intimidates citizens, lies, uh, brings the worst out of the ugliest uh, sinecures of our society, uh, deals with inter intimidation, and also allows Wall Street to prevail, huge tax cuts for the super rich, and then cutting into the social safety net, blocking the child tax extension, for example, on and on, that uh, it, there is a choice. There is also a choice for third party and independents. And now we have about five presidential candidates, Green Party, Libertarian Party, and several independent candidates for people to contemplate. I never tell people how to vote, but I want to show them that there is a difference in the uh, the two parties, as I just discussed. Both of them should be shunted aside by the voters. They should be replaced with uh, new political configurations, of course, and a tremendous mobilization of the people to recover Congress, state legislatures, uh, to whom they have given huge delegated powers under the federal and state constitution. Since uh, October 7th, of course, Biden has shown that he is willing, in secret, uh, as well as publicly, uh, to support the supremacists of the military regime in Israel over the Palestinian people without limitation. You remember, Brianna, both he and the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense said they were sending uh, unlimited arms shipments to Israel following decades of continual arms shipment, quote, without limitation, unquote. And that means that they are likely to violate two existing federal laws, which say the U.S. is prohibited from giving arms to any government that abuses human rights in a systematic way and that uses these weapons for offensive rather defensive purposes. So they're violating their own laws that they swore to uphold. And now they want to uh, provide advanced arms to Israel without even notifying Congress. That's uh, a little too much for some of the Democrats in the Senate and House. 
there's a limit to which they can be stripped of their constitutional duties by the imperial presidency. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to, when making an argument as to why I think people should embrace parties outside of the corporate duopoly, sometimes folks will try to pin you down and say, well, Democrats are better than Republicans though, right? And I don't feel like it's necessary to deny that truth, at least in some some contexts and other contexts, they're not. But in, in like I'd say the majority of political contexts, that that's true in order to make the case that neither is adequate and that one shouldn't feel compelled to vote for either or to vote for the Democratic Party simply because it's better than Republicans. But the way that this article, at least, is framing your statements, I mean, the title of it is Ralph Nader, Wary of Trump, Offers to Help Joe Biden Win. and doesn't frame it as, you know, B Democrats are better than Trump, but also you should reject both in favor of an independent candidate or a Green Party candidate or what have you. So I wonder, what did you make of the framing of that article? Did, did, did you push back? Have you talked to them about it? Is it do you think it's dishonest? Yes, I, I called up the reporter. Reporters are not responsible for headlines. For the headline, sure. The headline was misleading, and uh, it led to a lot of wrong impressions. Uh, the Republicans are worse than the Democrats domestically. The mm -hmm. Republicans and Democrats are both about on the same wavelength in terms of the military empire around the world, uh, lawless wars, uh, attacking anybody at will, drones, special forces, uh, toppling regimes. They're pretty much the same uh, in terms of foreign and military policy, military budget uh, supported by Democrats and Republicans. They give the generals more than they ask for. Uh, on these annual budgets uh, for the uh, military-industrial complex. Now, having said that, they're both inadequate. They're both uh, are a scar on the conscience of the American people. So the fact that you can differentiate between one and, and the other on domestic policies, mostly social safety net, uh, they don't really do much, either of them, to rein in Wall Street or the big oil companies, the big drug yeah. companies. The rhetoric's a little different. But they're both grossly inadequate. And people should vote their conscience. People should not vote tactically. Then they become prisoners of the Electoral College and don't want to join the civic movement to get rid of it. There's a civic movement that's well along now, uh, getting laws in various states like New York, Chicago, California, uh, Illinois, rather, California, Maryland, Connecticut, they, these states and others have passed laws as part of an interstate compact that says that if they get to 270 electoral votes, they, they will give their electoral votes to anyone who wins the popular national presidential vote count, which neutralizes the Electoral College and avoids a constitutional amendment because under the Constitution, the states can set their own electoral rules. And that is now at 210 electoral mm -hmm. uh, votes. And it's a completely citizen movement that the Democrats foolishly has not ha have not supported, even though they've lost two presidential elections in 2000, 2016, after having won the presidential vote count nationally because of the Electoral College. So you got a a party that cannot landslide the most vicious, cruel, ignorant, um, warmongering, anti-worker, anti-children, anti-women, anti-environment GOP in history. And, and they're just barely squeaking by or losing by a squeak. So that's the state. We just got to mobilize all these rallies and marches into politically uh, organized uh, movements that take over uh, the electoral process and start anew, as Abraham Lincoln once said, we have to start anew. You, you said a moment ago that you don't think people should vote strategically, they should vote their conscience. But in a moment like this, where there are, as, as you've pointed out, a number of left-leaning options in the 2024 race, whether it's in the Democratic primary context, someone like Marion Williamson or Cenk Uger, whether or not it's one of the independents like uh, 
Cornel West and some people are, still see RFK Jr. as a more left alternative to Joe Biden, whether or not it's uh, Jill Stein running as a Green Party or, you know, wh whatever these options are, does it make sense for the left to try to choose among those for strategic reasons? Whether it's to say, uh, I'm a registered Democrat, so I'm going to pick a non-Biden person in the primary and we should all get behind one non-Biden leftist. And in the general election, we should all get behind the same third party candidate so that our votes matter the most. Or to say, perhaps, even if I love Cornell West, is it more advantageous for us to throw our lot behind the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, because it will help the party get federal matching funds and ballot access and help efforts down the line? I mean, do you think there's any merit to thinking along those terms? Well, you get caught that way. You get trapped. And, and, and because if you don't vote your conscience, what are you going to vote? You vote for a candidate you don't fully believe in. Well, in what ways don't you fully believe in? Well, you like those candidates stand on Social Security, increasing benefits and uh, consumer protection and, and climate. But the candidate is also terrible on Wall Street and war and empire. So you get in a crossfire. That's why you should just vote your conscience. And, and let the uh, and let the counting produce the result. But but what if I genuinely support someone like Cornell West and genuinely support someone like Jill Stein, who I voted for in the past? That I think that's that's the 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 question that I personally am confronting. And to, to try to make a decision between those choices, I am considering. Well, how far does my vote go? How useful this is, but who's likely to get more votes? Who's more likely to make an impression on the national stage and register my discontent with the two-party system? You know, what are the who's mo most likely to be able to capture the energy of the election and funnel it into something that's more of a long-term political project? You know, I mean, how are you thinking about the fact that we now have these two, I think, sincerely left candidates to choose from? Well, again, you know, uh, <laughs> just to repeat myself, um, you could look and ask yourself, what state are you in? I mean, if you're mm -hmm. in the state of Massachusetts, you, you, it's easier to vote your conscience, uh, even if you were prone to voting tactically, because no, no Republican candidate is going to win the state of Massachusetts or the District of Columbia. So in the vast majority of the states, uh, the, the result is almost... Uh, uh, easily predictable. There are only about seven or eight swing states to begin with, because we operate in a winner-take-all, which is a very cruel way for people who uh, are on the losing end, but barely. So if, if you vote for a candidate who gets 49% of the vote and the winner gets 51, you're left with nothing under our system. There's no proportional representation as there is in other Western countries where they... Uh, in Germany, for example, if, if you get over 5% of the vote, you start getting over 5% of the parliament. And that's how the Greens got a leg up, and they went to 10%, and they got 10%. It gives you a chance to have a chance. But here in our system, uh, you know, if, if, if they were following nature, uh, no seeds would be ever to sprout. It would only be two giant trees in the forest. So... Hmm. Uh, I always say, when you vote your conscience, you're more likely to be informed. You're more uh, voting tactically. It's more likely to just to just follow some politician or some local uh, political who you've been a neighbor of. But when you vote your conscience, you got to be more of a thinking voter to to explain to yourself why you're not going to go with uh, the ma majority or with the conventional political channels. Yeah, I, I totally take your point about why um, strategic voting, tactical voting isn't wouldn't be my choice and it's not something that I advocate more broadly. But I guess what I'm asking about is something a little different, which is what if voting your, your conscience is, is very much actually divided and you see two options that you would be affirmatively excited about is there any strategy that comes in when choosing between them, given that there are certain really concrete benefits that accrue from, let's say, a party getting a certain number of votes 
uh, or like the Green Party, for instance, versus an independent who isn't going to channel perhaps those, uh, you know, the, 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 the vote tally that he gets doesn't go anywhere if he loses, for example. And maybe the best way to ask this is to ask you specifically how you're thinking. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot and ask you how you're going to, going to vote, but how would you go about assessing the choice between someone like Cornell West and someone like Jill Stein? Well, first, you, you look at their record. You don't just listen to their rhetoric. You look at their record. You look at the level of knowledge they have of larger and larger frames of reference around the world and the country. Uh, and uh, you look at their temperament. You look at their ego. Uh, are they going to want to hire people who maybe they think are better and smarter than they are? Or uh, do they uh, fear having people who are super, supremely qualified and know more about this and that than they do? So you look at all those factors. Once you go at all of the factors, you really come down to one choice when you do a, a conscientious vote. It's not, it's not hard. There aren't that many choices around to begin with. I mean, this isn't like uh, other Western European countries where they have numerous people uh, on the ballot uh, at the top and the middle and at the, at the bottom. I mean, in places like Texas and Massachusetts, there are about two-thirds of the legislators in Austin and Boston don't even have the other party opponent on the ballot. They don't even have an opponent. So the, the choices are very narrow. The main thing is to build movements behind your vote, because the vote, you know, is, is a bit of tinsel in an oligopoly or a plutocracy. And the main thing is when you vote your conscience, you're more likely to think about uh, connecting with others. You're more likely to think about building civic movements. You know, start with local uh, local elections, uh, third parties. Uh, get hollowed out because they have a presidential candidate and they only have a few people running locally among the thousands of local uh, candidacies there are board of education, city council, so forth around the country. So they have no base. Uh, they have no get out the vote base because they have no uh, candidates on the party at the state and local level, just at the presidential level. The main mm -hmm. thing is is for people to recover their government. And they've got to learn what happens to their livelihood and their quality of life, their families and communities when that occurs, which is why we started this newspaper, Capital Citizen, which we're going to talk about uh, shortly at capitalcitizen.com, because it, it, it's the only newspaper that focuses on Congress and unofficial journalism. Unofficial journalism. Uh, Make sure that you learn about Congress, uh, not only in ways you don't learn in the independent press or the mainstream press, but you learn about Congress in a way that makes you encouraged and motivated to become a capital citizen yourself. You know, mm -hmm. all the great progress in, in America throughout history have never required more than 1% of active people to pull it off. And it starts with less than 1%. As long as they know what they're talking about, they reflect public opinion or they're building majority or supermajority public opinion, and they focus on the decision-making arena, like uh, the Congress or the state legislature or the courts. So even in the civil rights movement, it never had more than 1%. I mean, 1% of the adults now is 2.5 million people uh, distributed in congressional districts. We, we got the auto industry regulated from zero uh, in Congress to unanimous passage in 1966, the biggest industry then in the country, for safety, fuel efficiency, and pollution control. And we never had more than 1,000 people working uh, as volunteers around the country on their members of Congress and getting issues in the press, highlighting recalls of defective cars that were secret and so forth. And if people think of the other 1%, not the 1% that runs the country, like uh, Walt, the Occupy Wall Street highlighted over a decade ago, 
Mm -hmm. The other 1%, in area after area, if you had 1% on universal health care, are you kidding? You got 60, 70% of the people already want universal health care. This is before any major political movement behind it. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you would get universal health care in less than a two-year cycle in Congress. If you did it on a living wage, it would be less than a two-year cycle. The problem, Brianna, is there's nobody out there on whole numbers of democracy deserts. I call democracy deserts our centers of the deployment of sheer power without any civic engagement. That's the military budget, for example. That's the corporate tax system, for example. That's uh, often many city halls, for example. Uh, that's the uh, uh, lack of labor law reform. Uh, unions are not putting anything on labor law reform and getting rid of all the chains on people from being able to form labor unions under the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which they have not challenged. Uh, you name an area, and it's a democracy desert. And so why should we be pessimistic? I mean, if, if you were playing basketball against uh, UConn, the UConn women's team, and, uh, and you were the only person on the court, and they had five players, and you lost 200 to 10, uh, what would be the observation? The observation is you needed more people on the floor. Well, there are, the lobbyists, corporate lobbyists outnumber citizen lobbyists in Washington on issue after issue by over 100 to 1. And they're backed by dealers and agents, auto dealers, insurance agents back home, and a ton of money. So when you see if people just got on the field of action on their members of Congress, which is the, the most powerful institution in the entire world, that's the institution that makes the military industrial empire possible. It makes the corporate tax evaders possible. It makes everything possible. I mean, that's what it is under the Constitution. It's the primary branch of government. It's not the equal branch. It's the tax branch, the declare war branch, the spending branch, the nomination confirmation of judges branch, the investigatory branch. And it turns out it's the smallest branch. Only 535 men and women who put their shoes on like we do every day. What are we waiting for? Even Warren Buffett once said, we're 300 million people. Why can't we control Congress? It's because we've given up. We, we don't uh, learn civics and learn civic skills in school. We learn about computers and stems so we can be cogs in the giant corporate wheel when we get out of school. So we don't have adult education, training, civic skills. How do, how do you influence uh, a member of Congress? Uh, you know, how do you mobilize voters? How do you publicize the voting record? How do you get through the flim flam? How do you summon your members back to your own town meetings? We, had, we put out a book recently called, um, uh, it was basically say, it's easier than we think. What I meant mm -hmm. by that is it's easier to turn Congress around, therefore, shuck off all these corporate lobbyists as if they're just floats them and gets, gets them. Once, once the people get mobilized, the corporations don't have any votes, not yet at least. They have money. Why do the members of Congress want the money? So, so they can scare off primary opponents and put a lot of ads on TV. Well, if the people organize with a cutting edge to their vote, and summon their senators and representatives to repeated town meetings. You know, they only work three days a week when they're in Congress, and they have huge recesses, like all of August. Now, you, you summon them back, and you tell them in advance what you want to demand that they do. So they uh, bone up on it, and they don't say, well, we'll go back and think about it. And then you have them uh, on the stage, and, and you question them, and people in the audience. I mean, how hard is that? 500 petitions with legible names and occupation can bring any member of the House anywhere to a town meeting. 1,000 to 1,500 can bring any senator. They don't hear from the people. They freak out. You just get 1,000 legible names with occupations and emails. So we got to give people a, 
uh, you know, heart. We got it. We got to show that they can get it done. They're too discouraged. There was a New York Times page one piece you probably saw, Brianna, about three weeks ago, where they said people are so turned off Washington that they don't even bother complaining. Well, that's a bunch of quitters. I mean, I mean, come on, grow up, people. You're the sovereign people. It's we the people in the Constitution. It's not we the corporation or we the Congress. We've got to stop uh, uh, soft peddling and coddling people who are hurting and who agree with you, but, you know, just keep looking at their iPhone screens day after day. Mr. Nader, I hear you on, on one level, but if I pick up your um, Brianna Gray versus the UConn women's basketball team analogy, I think, frankly, if I could put up 10 points playing solo against a, a college professional level athlete team, then that would tell me that either their defense is horrible <laughs> or I've got a pretty amazing half court shot. <laughs> And I think to carry that on to this political analogy, I would say that people's concern is that it's not just uh, the underdog, the David putting up 10 points against Goliath's 200. What it feels like often is that it's zero to 100, that it's uh, that there are such finely honed mechanisms to circumvent democracy, whether it is the influence of money in politics, the um invulnerability of so many of these Congress members to push back from their constituents because they can do enough ad spends to save their necks at the last minute. When you see the pernicious influence, the enormous influence that APAC, a DMFI, these um, Israel Alliance Super PACs have had on Congress, so much so that you got 22 Democrats crossing the aisle to join the Republicans in censuring Rashida Tlaib, and uncritically, as you've pointed out, an unqualified in an unqualified way, supporting all of this additional aid to Israel as they commit all of these human rights violations against the people of Gaza. I mean, that's that's why people, I, in the in the defense of the people who may or may not have given up, or at least feel like they have to radically change their strategy, it does feel like the uphill nature of this task has only gotten harder post-Citizens United and the like. And I do wonder if you've given any thought to a need to shift strategies at all, or if you still think that there is meaningful influence that can be had from letter writing campaigns, calling well, and texting. Let, let me dissect like what you just said, because it's important. Sure. And we've treated that uh, observation in the Capitol Citizen on more than one occasion. Let's take it in two phases here. The first phase is, uh, if you say, all right, the majority of the people want universal health care. The majority of the people want a new tax system so the big companies, the super rich, don't pay, uh, you know, sometimes zero tax on their profits or they pay 5%. They pay less than a plumber or electrician in terms of percentage. Mm -hmm. And go down the line. How many people are working full time on this? If you ask how many people are working just to get the military budget, to obey federal law since 1992 and send an audited set of accounting to the Congress. They've been violating it, and the Secretary of Defense have, have conceded. They've been violating it uh, since 1992. How many people are working full-time on it? Zero. Zero in the civic community. And how many people are working full-time now uh, to get Congress to uh, enact universal health care? My best guess? not more than 15 nationwide. What do you expect? You got 450 lobbyists from the drug companies on Congress alone. So, you know, in area after area, you cannot exaggerate the opposition, whether it's politicians in hock to corporations or corporations themselves, when there's nobody organized to oppose them. Now, when we got the environmental laws through, we got the consumer protection laws through. We got OSHA laws through with, with a few thousand people around the country organized and it, to, to, to get on their members of Congress, to get into the media, to make sure there are public hearings and to do it day after day. Now, let's look at the other part of your comment, APAC. Now, APAC uh, and its associates uh, uh, have determined uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East. To an extraordinary degree, everybody knows that. When, when they go up to Congress, 
they already have 400 votes out of 425 in the House and anywhere from 95 to 98 votes in the Senate, sometimes because two senators are absent. So this is as as high a degree of influence, even on resolutions passed while the Israelis are slaughtering Gaza in their periodic wars. Right when they're slaughtering Gaza, bombing the defenseless people, as the Herod's columnist Gideon Levy uh, has pointed out in his columns on more than one occasion, Congress is passing resolutions saying Israel has a right to defend itself. It's like the Palestinians don't have a right to defend themselves. Who's who's the subjugated and who's the subjugator? I mean, mm-hmm. who's the colonized? Who's the colonizer? Who has ninety nine percent of the weapons, and who hasn't got any weapons? And yet, you can't get a member of Congress, with the exception of twenty, as you indicated, to even mouth the words. The Palestinian families and people have a right to defend themselves. Okay. Now, you know what power APAC has? Here's what it has. They they have honed civic action to a level that I've urged people who support APAC to open citizen action clinics all over the country to teach us how to organize on Congress on all kinds of civic issues in our country, some of which I've just mentioned. Here's what they do. First thing they do is they, they make a strong rhetorical case. Then they go out and they get about 300,000 people who are real activists in congressional districts. They have a major convention here of 10,000 every year where they summon the senators and representatives. I mean, you don't say no to an APAC convention. These 300,000 are given strict assignments and they are motivated and mobilized. And the Holocaust is never far from the, their memories. And so they're motivated. And what do they do? Well, first of all, they introduce themselves personally to members of Congress. Have you ever seen APAC engaged in a mass demonstration or a march? They don't bother Certainly with things not. like that. They engage in personal, personal pressure on members of Congress and their staff. They know about everything that they can learn. They know who the lawyers are, who the accountants are for the senators represent, who their doctors are, who they play golf with, and they start proselytizing those people. And so uh, when when the issue comes of how much money they're going to give to Israel, what kind of weapons, and on and on, uh, it's all it's all set up. They've done their homework. They're all over Capitol Hill. Now, let's say somebody defies them. If somebody defies them, they operate with a carrot and a stick. And if they uh, show their, quote, strong friends of Israel, they give them APAC and and associate APAC campaign money. They praise them. They invite them to dinners. Uh, If they defy them, then they, they, they look for a primary candidate. They start accusing them of anti-Semitism. Uh, they they uh, fill the switchboards with calls. They demand meetings locally and and on Capitol Hill. So you get members of Congress, even Arab Americans like Daryl Issa, who's a Republican and at the time from a safe district in California, and he's a multimillionaire. And he voted for a resolution condemning uh, uh, the people of Gaza. Uh, and supporting Israel's bombing of Gaza in a prior war, 2014-2009. And he's a Syrian American, and mm-hmm. he's been to the Middle East. And I, I called him up and I said, Daryl, you know, what are you doing voting against your own people? I mean, for heaven's sake, mm-hmm. you know what the score is over there. You don't have to worry about re-election. Uh, you're a multimillionaire. You can fund your own campaign. Mm -hmm. He paused, and he said, well, you know why I voted for it? I said, why? He says, because he accused me of being anti-Semitic. Here's a guy who's an Arab, and and they accuse him, (laughs) and he's afraid of being accused of being anti-Semitic. Right. Well, we all know what technically what Semite means and all of that, but outside of that kind of strict definition, do you think that because he's Arab-American, he feels more vulnerable to those kinds of attacks. 
No, not at all. He's a very strong character. If, if you know anything about him, he, he's a real hawk. And, and he really went after Obama when he was uh, chair of the House Oversight Committee. Hmm. No, he, he just, here's the point. The, the, the best point is, when you talk to members of Congress about APAC and Israel can do no wrong lobby, they basically say, look, these guys drive us nuts. You know, they, they take up our time. Uh, you know, we can't go anywhere in our district before they're on our back and and accusing us of this and that. And so after all, we just say, here, we just throw in the towel. Uh, you know, what do you want us to do? Well, there's n- not much of a counter lobby. The, you know, Arab American Islamic lobby is getting a little bit more vociferous. They uh, pulled off a great march in uh, Washington, as you know, mm-hmm. close to 200,000 people marched. Uh, uh, a few days ago, on Saturday, uh, mm-hmm. from Freedom Plaza to the White House, uh, but th- they haven't shown the muscle that makes the media respect them. That was the biggest march in years in Washington since mm-hmm. the Women's March on the first uh, day after Trump took office. The biggest march. It was on page 28, next to the obituary page in New York Times. Mm-hmm. It was on the page three, the Metro page in the Washington Post, and it isn't a Metro issue, it's a national, international issue. Now, the, there's going to be an Israeli march, a pro-Israeli march on Tuesday, and we'll see where the Post and New York Times place it in terms mm-hmm. of coverage. So the media respects power. The more power you have, the more coverage you're going to get. And But that's the analysis of the APAC pro-Israeli lobby. They've, they've honed it to perfection. And, and uh, they should be teaching all kinds of uh, civic groups to make this country better, uh, apart from their special issue over there in the Middle East, because they, they've got the patent on how to mobilize citizens and make Congress do what they want. So two, two things on that. I would ask you whether you think that the power of just the anti-Semitism charge is waning at all in light of kind of what we're seeing out of Gaza, the real visceral images that we're, we're getting, um, the size of the protest, the, the sense that you're not as isolated as you might have felt in years past to feel solidarity with the people of Palestine. We are seeing even a shift in the public acceptance of a phrase like from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, where a few years ago, Mark Lamont Hill is fired from CNN for saying it. And now instead of, you know, kind of having to backtrack and say, well, I thought it meant this, and but I respect that other people think it's anti-Semitic. People are pretty vociferously saying, we said what we said. It means what it means. It's not anti-Semitism and you're overcharging people with anti-Semitism. Do, yeah, go ahead. First of all, Brianna, look, they are cheapening the word anti-Semitic. I mean, anti-Semitic mm. historically was related to the Russian pogroms, the, the, the Nazi slaughter. Uh, and now, if you stand up against the the Israeli F-16s blowing whole families apart in apartment buildings, schools, clinics, hospitals, blowing apart water mains, following military orders that are purely genocidal, according to the strict definition of genocide under the Genocide Convention. As the Minister of Defense said, no water, no no food, no medicine, no fuel, no electricity, and we're going to put a complete siege around 2.3 million people. Um, and you describe uh, what a missile can do to a human being and you describe that almost half of the victims are children and that the children uh, are uh, being uh, not even located under the rubble and there's no uh, excavation to even recover their bodies and the babies are being born with death certificates before they can even have birth certificates and hospitals can't do surgery and they can't dispense medicine and then they call you anti-Semitic. Well, the more they do that, the more it becomes a caricature. The more they are turning their back on the serious anti-Semitism in Europe uh, years ago, decades ago, 
and the more they're going to be a caricature. Moreover, they are committing anti-Semitism against Arabs. The Jews don't own the word anti-Semitism. If they're talking about the Semitic race, the largest number are Arabs. Their, their cousins are the smallest numbers, the Jews. And the Arab Americans are not smart enough because they are being vilified. They're being uh, bigoted against. Uh, they're being denied opportunities in this country. Uh, they don't know how to cry out and say, you know, this is anti-Semitism against mm -hmm. Arab Americans. Uh, but as long as they have exclusive possession of that word, even though it's being diluted by them almost to absurd levels to stifle free speech, it still is a very powerful thing on politicians on Capitol Hill, and they'll be the first to admit it. Uh, now, we have in the first issue of the Capitol Citizen, uh, they, it, there was printed all the anti-Semitic epithets the vicious vituperatives by high Israeli officials over the years, calling Palestinians vermin, uh, rats, subhuman, uh, you know, every conceivable thing, a snake, uh, uh, associated with phrases like kill them all. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that has never been used in this country by people who are critical of our foreign policy. And the uh, is Israel can do no wrong lobby. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities here, uh, and a lot of the uh, Jewish groups, the Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, they should get the Nobel Prize. They're so mm -hmm. courageous, and you can imagine what they're being exposed to, mm -hmm. and they're very, very skilled organizers, and they're working with uh, Arab American, Palestinian American groups. Uh, they, they're reaching new heights here. They're getting more people out. They're more strategic in where they're sit-ins, and Nonviolent civil disobedience uh, 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 work is on Capitol Hill and around the Statue of Liberty and mm -hmm. Madison in uh, Grand Central Station, for example, mm -hmm. and around the country. But that just says more work has to be done. When Rashida Tlaib was uh, censored by the genocidalists in, Cong in the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. she mentioned like. A vast majority of Democrats in Michigan, uh, according to the latest poll, want to cease fire over there. Cease fire mm -hmm. means stop killing. That's all. That's the important thing. Not any, oh, it'll get Hamas will be able to regroup. Hamas has nothing to regroup. You want to describe what happened on October 7th that doesn't appear in the press? Here's what happened, according to Israeli sources. It was a one-time raid by several thousand Hamas fighters chosen at a relatively young age because they've lost their sisters or brothers or mothers or cousins or fathers in prior Israeli wars against them. So mm -hmm. they chose them because they were so motivated that way for revenge. Number two, they, they were unemployed and they mm -hmm. felt hopeless. They had no will to live anymore. And in that culture, when you're unemployed, you're, you're going to have a hard time getting married, raising a family. So they sent them over there. Uh, the, the Hamas and others are probably stunned that they even got so far. And it was a homicide-suicide mission. They knew they were going to die. And so they started shooting anything they saw, whether it was soldiers, uh, a, a party going on, uh, civilians in their homes, until they were wiped out. Some of them got back with hostages. Uh, and of course, there are 7,000 hostages in Israeli prisons of Palestinians because they are abducted in order to extract information from their relatives in Gaza and the West Bank. That's an old practice. And they control extended families that way. So that's why we, uh, Bruce Fine and I, petitioned Biden to have a hostage-to-hostage -hostage exchange uh, mm. in order to start a process of reconciliation and resolution of that conflict over there. But in terms of the attack, the Israeli government, once after the attack, said they counted 1,600 Hamas bodies that they killed uh, uh, in the shootout on October 7th. And that's more than the estimated uh, Israelis that were killed by these Hamas right. fighters. So you can see that the 
something wrong with the numbers here. And uh, about 100 of the Israeli 1,400, by the way, were migrant workers. They were Thai migrant workers, Polish migrant workers, and, and Arab Bedouins, uh, you know, working in the orchards innocently, and they were killed mm. savagely. So this idea that Hamas is an existential threat to Palestine is absurd. It was a one-time raid uh, that caught the military napping, <laughs> and they're never going to get over the border again, no matter what they do. Uh, and so that's why we, we got to stop this attempt to treat this whole war as if it's Israel's war of survival. It's nothing of the sort. Yeah, I mean, I, I the, the second part I was going to ask you about was when you're talking about the power that APEC has, even if it's not directly just money and ad buys for candidates. When you describe the infrastructure that they have, the ability to have full-time employees working to know who Congressman X's dental hygienist is and what have you, that still is a money issue, right? That still requires, to have someone working full-time doing that, that means they can't have an alternate job that they used to keep a roof over their head and feed their family. And so I do wonder about what that means for the left, which isn't financed by big moneyed interest, whose, whose own interests and own politics are often very discordant with the interests of people who have money, with maybe a handful of exceptions like that Abigail Disney lady. <laughs> so what, well, what I mean, as I hear you talk, <clears throat> Brianna, I keep saying to your listeners and viewers how important it is for them get, to get the capital citizen. So let me put a plug in. The new Please. issue is just out, 40 pages, beautifully designed. Go to capitalcitizen.com, and for $5 or more, if you wish, you can get a copy and get more extra copies, to, as many people have done with the prior issues, to pass out to their friends, neighbors, schoolmates, uh, civic activists, whatever. And uh, you'll get a first class immediately. Uh, within 24 hours of your order, it will be put in the post office first class, and it's just print only. Uh, we're experimenting with print. Uh, the the table of contents is on citizen uh, uh, on capitalcitizen dot com, and people love the print. They they say I'm holding a newspaper without the distraction, without the mm -hmm. ads, without the clutter. Thank you for giving us a print newspaper. But all of the issues that you're raising and more are described in penetrating detail. Uh, plus proposals for empowerment. For example, two little bills, two short bills, would change the whole politics in this country. One, a bill that goes through Congress saying any time uh, the, the country is engaged in war or protracted armed conflict, all the age-qualified uh, children and grandchildren of all members of Congress are immediately drafted. Mm. They're immediately constricted. You will see Congress reasserting itself and becoming not a, uh, a hoopla for uh, outlaw presidents to get us into war or armed conflicts. The other bill is simple. Any benefits that Congress gives to itself, pensions, health, and health insurance, other expenses, any benefits they give to themselves, they can't give to themselves unless they give to all the American people, all the American people. Now, we've yeah, got I that on that. page one. If we just get one sponsor with the bills, the two bills, and they're drafted right on page one. Get one sponsor. Uh, we'll get a bill number. We can motivate people around. My guess is 95% of the people, liberal, conservative, libertarian, uh, radical, you name it, would support this. That is what a real organized coalition looks like so basic and so relevant to where people of all political backgrounds live work and raise their families partisan ideologies red state blue state they all fade away people in the south bleed the same way from the drug companies and the credit card companies and wall street as people in the blue north yeah and so that that's what that's what this and there's great uh, articles on the Middle East, uh, on the Gaza-Israel area, on a new book out on the Israeli surveillance system where they use the Palestinian people 
as Tess. There, I, I especially loved um, the piece uh, uh, which explained how policing techniques in Israel are being exported around the world. Um, I love the deep dive into the um, the West campaign. And I really loved, I think it was a page one, it was a cover story asking about the potential of a kind of right-left coalition and whether or not it's really feasible to, um, h- how did you put it, uh, to separate the corporatists from the principal, the co- corporatist conservatives from the principled conservatives and put together a genuine um, populist movement. I, I did want to ask you a little bit about that. I mean, do you really, do you believe, I don't mean to inject my own um, skepticism into this, but do you believe that there are members of the Republican Party who have demonstrated a kind of consistency and principle about uh, issues like, let's say, corporate corruption in Congress? Yeah. Well, a, ma- a vast majority of Republicans oppose Citizens United, the Supreme Court mm-hmm. decision to open the doors to unlimited corporate money in campaigns. Uh, of that, it's, it's over 80%. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look on minimum wage, universal health care, cracking down on corporate crooks, breaking up Wall Street banks, you get huge, 75, 80, 85%. You can't do that without getting a lot of conservatives. There is a, a quite a difference between Republican voters back home. Uh, once you take them out of the Trump manipulation uh, zone and, and focus them on where they work, live, and raise their families uh, and what they want for their children and public services, uh, you, you get that left-right coalition. But it's being obscured by the divide-and-rule tactics of the, the two-party duopoly. I mean, for over 2,000 years, rulers have divided and ruled the people. That's how th- they get to it. And so Russell McIver has a brilliant essay on the back <clears throat> called uh, Self-Serve. And he, he, he takes all these excuses that people give for not being active citizens and, and takes them apart in a very friendly and funny way. Mm. And <laughs> And the cartoon is even uh, funnier. So he ends by saying, uh, what is your uh, civic IQ? He said, we know that a collective civic IQ of 30, just 30 out of 100, would make our country and our world a better place to live. Let's get off the coach. Let's put down the phones and let's begin exercising our civic muscles. There are also articles on organized labor and what they have to do, organized on the uh, deliberate uh, strategy of marketing to increase obesity in this country uh, by the, uh, the fast food processes and the, and the food corporate lobbying on Capitol Hill. It's uh, one that really caught my attention is 60 to 80 percent of high schoolers say they've gambled for money in the past year. And huh. the gambling industry is targeting these youngsters. You know, mm-hmm. they can do it from home on their cell phone. But imagine, 60 to 80 percent. These corporations are worsening the health of these children. They're separating them, Silicon Valley, iPhone style, from their parents, community, nature, five, seven hours a day, selling them dangerous junk products, exposing them to violent programming and nastiness, creating depression. All kinds of mental health problems that Republicans and Democrats are all speaking out against at state legislative level and, and at attorney general level, by the way. And now they're going to want to addict them to gambling. These corporate mm-hmm. criminals are out of control. They're electronic child molesters. And, and, we, and we don't mount a movement against that. The corporate uh, usurpation of our country, the corporate state, which is a, a, a phrase for American style fascism that Franklin Delano Roosevelt warned about in 1938 in a message to Congress says, when private power controls government, that's fascism. That was in 1938. And they control government far more now. They've turned government into corporate guaranteed capitalism. There's no such thing as a free market for big business. They go to Washington, subsidies, handouts, bailouts, half of what Washington does is servicing these corporations. Quotas, protections from competition, you name it, tax loopholes, tax breaks, 
tax expenditures. You got these big Silicon Valley companies that make tons of billions of dollars. They don't pay 5% in federal income tax. How much do your uh, listeners out there uh, on the podcast, how much do you pay? You pay more than 5%? Hmm. That's what Russell McCarver means. Get off the cow- couch. Uh, couch, rather. Y- you're, uh, you're part of the sovereignty of the people. You start out with a big asset. It's called We the People, Preamble to the Constitution. So if you, for $5 or more, go get a copy of the brand-new Capitol Citizen, 40 pages full of material, great graphics, readable print. Get some more for your friends. Start living room, reading circles. If you want to donate more, fine. Uh, but spread the word. We're doing this for you people. You think the members of Congress like this? It's delivered to them, by the way, Brianna. Oh, on really? The morning of the printing, every member of Congress gets this by delivery service. Uh, they don't want to read what's in it. They don't want the people to know about it, because article after article tears apart the curtain from the cocoon of Congress that is spoon-fed to 1,500 corporations that swarm all over it. Yeah, I mean, I was I was surprised and kind of. Uh flattered to see even a, a picture of me and Robbie <laughs> in this edition <laughs> in an article called well, it has great interviews. Yeah. It has great <laughs> interviews of people who speak the truth like you do. People who are covering Congress and nobody knows their names. And I appreciate and that. They're, and they're and they're a lot of Norm Finkelstein in here too. Yeah. I, it, it really is very interesting content. Strongly recommend it. Um, I did want to ask you one last question about something that was in one of the interviews. Um, I think it was in, sorry, in one of the articles. I think it was in the story about Cornell West. Um, the, you, it described you as actually advising Dr. West to run as an independent as opposed to on the Green Party uh, ticket. And I, and I wondered about that advice and what you make of his departure from the Greens. That'll be my last horse race question for you. Well, I, I know Cornell West. He's not mm-hmm. an organizational person. He, mm-hmm. he likes to be free and clear. Uh, you get involved in Green Party politics, as I know from firsthand. There's a lot of internal bickering. you got to travel here and travel there to put out the conflict flames and, and the what debilitating kind of conflict? process. What, what, he, he alluded to that, but I just it's hard for me to understand what that looks like and why that's such a seemingly indelible feature of the Green Party. Well, you know, I've tried it uh, many, many days and months at Green Party fundraisers to bring them together. The problem with the Green Party is they're upper middle class, most of them. Hmm. Uh, I'm not saying they're rich, but they're not part of the, you know, hard scrabble blue collar class. And uh, they're not hurting that much. And as a result, they don't have an energy level. Uh, they don't have enough fire in their belly. They have flaming rhetoric, and it's it's very well substantiated uh, by the facts in the country. I'll grant them that. They have the best uh, agenda of any political party in the country by far on foreign, military, and domestic policy. But if you can't field thousands of local candidates, you're not going to build the party. If you can't raise money for full-time staff around the country, you're not going to build the party. And they haven't gotten around to figure out how to do that. They also but, don't like yeah. leadership. If you don't like leadership, you just work on consensus and navel-gazing. You're never going to find the leaders in one area after another of your political movement who can really push the envelope and, and break through the two-party duopoly. Well, I guess the question people have is all of those taking taking completely at face value all of those criticisms of the Green Party. It seems like there's even less of that if you're a part of no party, if you're running fully as an independent. And while there are some upsides, polling suggests that generic independent candidate does many, many times better than generic generic libertarian or generic Green Party candidate. There also is the question of ballot access, not having any infrastructure whatsoever. And if Cornel West is not an infrastructure person. Well, does that also cut both ways? Is he going to be able to independently build the infrastructure that he needs and to fundraise all that he needs to get on the ballot and make any kind of real impact? 
Well, he, he needs to hire half a dozen good people who know how to get on a ballot. Uh, and, and he needs to raise enough money to do that, to get on maybe, as he said, 25, 30 states. That, that gets you credible. This isn't about getting, uh, you know, decisive vote totals. This is about uh, agenda. This is about articulating where this country should go domestically and in the world. And Cornel West does a beautiful job on that. And he's got mm -hmm. huge energy. He can make hundreds of speeches during the campaign all over the country, going into red districts, talking to people who premier face may disagree with him. He's very good that way. And so that's an important voice to have. And if the press keeps giving him decent coverage uh, here and there on TV, radio, in the press, he will help push the Democrats and push politics into more progressive realms. It's not about really vote getting. Uh, it, it's about raising all these issues that I've raised. Uh, I, that's why I kept my presidential campaign uh, website open. Go to votenator.org. That's a 2008 campaign. And you'll see about 19 issues that are still current, that are still supported by a majority of people in this country that are off the table by the Democrats and off the table by the Republicans. But they're on the table on my campaign. So go to votenator.org. You'll see a lot of other things that I suggested to Cornell West that he should pick on that will get attention, uh, that will enlist more people in the campaign, and that will uh, get points across more convincingly. Uh, the website votenator.org is full of that. That's why I've kept it open. By the way, you know, I got to bring to your attention because you've put a lot of time on the, the slaughter in Gaza, Brianna. Bruce Fine, international law expert, constitutional law expert, has an article. The headline is a letter to President Biden. And the headline is, you are making the USA criminally accountable for Israel's war crimes. Technically, we are now under international law co-belligerents. That means we are exposed to any kind of retaliation that yeah. Israeli is exposed to under international law. We are co-belligerents, something that Biden created by his unconditional support yeah. for all arms, uh, all arms shipments and unconditional support of how they're to be used, even though there are two federal laws that condition arms exports to countries on human rights grounds and a ban on offensive use, as I pointed out earlier. This is in the Capitol Hill Citizen dot com. Five dollars or more, get a copy, sent to you immediately, first class mail, and feedback. So you make your suggestions and, and use the way we give you to, to summon your members of Congress back home to your own town meetings. In public auditoriums, school auditoriums, town halls, there's plenty of spaces. And you confront them without their flax or without their PR people. And you've done your homework and you show that it's, these issues are very often left-right issues. They don't know how to game left-right issues. They just know how to game one left issue or one right issue. And so this is what you can do. Be a Congress Watch hobbyist. Be a Congress Watch citizen. People have hobbies. They play bridge. You know, they bowl. So create a Congress Watch lobby back home with a letterhead and watch it grow and watch the member pay more and more attention to you. That's the way we did some of these things in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Audience, you heard it from Ralph Nader. I need you to put down the pickleball and pick up a copy of the Capitol Hill Citizen immediately. Re I really do very, very strongly recommend uh, buying this. And if you can, buying several copies to share with people who might not have the $5 to spare. Ralph Nader, my last question to you. You did mention some of these agenda items that are not being picked up by Congress members that are very popular. And I, and I did have this thought as perhaps America's most famous Arab American politician, most prominent Arab American politician. I do wonder if you see opportunities, if you've reached out to, if you've had any dialogue with someone like Rashida Tlaib, who's been catching so much flack, or Ilhan Omar, or anybody else, um, the, the progressives that have been standing with them in Congress, the few that have stood with them in Congress during the censure and the like. 
about using this moment of public support in the face of these censorious Congress members that are their colleagues to push some of these other agenda items through and broaden up this movement? Well, we've been reaching out to the squad since they were elected a few years ago. The biggest problem is they don't return, they don't return calls. Still? I've been down to Yon Omar's office twice. I've never been able to have a meeting with her. Uh, they, they don't connect with the national citizen groups. And unless they do, they're going to be siloed and controlled by the Democratic yeah. corporate Democratic leadership there. In, in the 60s and 70s, we went constantly back and forth with the citizen groups, members around the country, backing the senators on uh, and representatives on call, all kinds of issues. We now have incommunicado problems with them. Mm. Now, we, I, I've spoken to uh, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib recently, and she has now been supported by the leading Israeli-born uh, expert on genocide and the Holocaust who teaches at Brown University. Mm. He was on Amy Goodman the other day, and he, he said he he was very supportive of her uh, her words on, on the floor of the House, and very touched by them. Hmm. Now, does she know about that? Are there citizen groups putting her in touch with with heroic and knowledgeable supporters like that? So, Brianna, you want to have a program on why the citizen groups in Washington are not having the effect they had years ago? One big reason is that they're not getting their calls returned by Democrats who are supposed to be on their side, including mm. Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth mm -hmm. Warren. They won't even go on my radio podcast uh, program uh, after numerable requests, even to promote their own book. And that's yeah. and if, if they don't recognize the citizen groups, the press doesn't cover the reports and testimonies and, and litigation of the citizen groups. And if the press doesn't cover them, then the members of Congress don't respond. It becomes a vicious circle. It's a wonderful subject for you to probe on any one of your podcasts or uh, or uh, exchanges with your libertarian friend. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. I, I it is. I, I've said this. I've said this repeatedly that there are. I think there's this antagonistic relationship that has emerged between left media and uh, pro elected progressives, and they think they think that they are getting criticisms from left media, and therefore they should retrench. I think the reality is that, frankly, there can be a vaguely positive effect of access journalism, if I can say that, where, you know, part of the reason why I think they get so much harsh treatment from the from the left media, unreservedly harsh treatment at times, is because there's no downside to it. They've already made it clear after years and years of shirking left media that they're they're never going to come on the program. So what's the point in even trying to give them the benefit of the doubt in some instances? Now, I think that people should just have journalistic integrity, obviously, and only make fair hits at them. But it is it's it's this weird, it's like a Chinese finger trap where it's just getting worse and worse the more. Well, you let pull. me let me show what we're doing about it. And, yeah, you know, you're a graduate of Harvard Law School. You know full well that part of the First Amendment is the right to petition your government for redress of grievances. Mm. Well, if you write serious letters or petitions to members of Congress or executive branch agencies, and they don't even bother acknowledging receipt, never mind not responding, they are basically destroying your constitutional right to redress, for petition your government for redress of grievances. And we mm. pointed this out, Bruce Fine and I, in two introductions to a report called the Un incommunicados. And it has a, a lot of our letters, serious petitions and letters to the executive branch and to members of Congress that are totally ignored. And we and we wanted to make the constitutional point here that I just mentioned. And if people go to incommunicadoswatch.org, that's incommunicados with an S, watch.org, they can get a copy of this report, which will motivate them to start protesting more. How dare you? You, you, you? We're paying your salary. You're using our enormous delegated powers, and you don't even respond to us because we don't have a corporate campaign pack to feed your campaign, or we don't have to be, we don't happen to be your social buddies. Hmm. Can, you, can you tell us anything before we wrap about your conversation with Rashida Tlaib, how she's doing, if she understands that she's being supported 
next steps if she's fearful about a primary challenge or anything like that? Well, she, she's very strongly rooted in her district. It's, it's going to be a very tough uh, candidate, no matter how much money they have to dislodge her. The same with Elon Omar. And they're ready for it. Mm. And they know how to communicate with people. And they know how to show that they're on their side. But I'm worried that the way they uh, disparaged her and intimidated her inside the Congress itself, and that there hasn't been enough rebuttal, the kind of rebuttal that she and her allies should counter on the House floor and put in the congressional record, because these uh, genocidal maniacs that went after her, yeah. and, and I, this would never have happened years ago, they're completely out of control. It's like they're all competing to see who can be more vicious against the Palestinian people yeah. uh, than one another. Uh, they need rebuttals, and they're not getting rebuttals. They're getting uh, touching defense, defensive uh, statements on the floor. The squad should not be on the defense. They should be. Should, the other side should be on the should, defense. Should they be trying to censor someone like Max Miller, who said we should turn Gaza into a parking lot, or Lindsey Graham, or any of these others? Uh, I forget who it was, but there was a viral clip going around of a um, a black state rep, I think. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, how many Palestinian lives is it going to take before we stop this? And someone, another one of her colleagues shouts out, all of them. We are at 10,000 dead Palestinians. How many will be enough? I also, one of my colleagues just said all of them. Wow. One of my colleagues said all of them. One of my colleagues also stated that this is going to dry up their fundraising if we vote on this resolution. I also want that, like, that's what we've become in this state. That's what we've become in this state where we don't care about innocent babies that don't even get the opportunity to blow out their first birthday candle. You know, should people be, should they be pushing to censor folks who are saying those kind of genocidal remarks about Palestinians? Of course, they should demand disavowal. They should yeah. make uh, people like Senator Cotton, who said from Arkansas, another alumnus of Harvard Law School, he mm. said, I, I, I wouldn't mind if the Israelis made the, uh, made the Gaza rubble bounce, made the rubble mm -hmm. bounce, which is a, a vicious reference to what atomic bomb does to areas that it hits. It makes the rubble bounce in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he's never been uh, demanded to disavow that. They're yeah. vicious, anti-Semitic vituperous against the Palestinian Arabs. They have yeah. never been demanded to disavow that. The, uh, they've never been uh, told to, to disavow their association with vicious, uh, anti-racist uh, uh, words by high uh, Israeli officials. I mean, you don't win the political battle by just playing defense. Mm. You've got to play offense. And you've got human rights and evidence and videos and all kinds of things on your side, including a growing number of Americans in the polls who are now seeing what's happened over the years to the Palestinian people. It's not their fault. You remember, the founder of Israel and first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, in an oft-quoted remark uh, to Nahum Goldman, then head of the World Zionist Organization, and Goldman printed it in his book in 1978, published by Grossa and Dunlop in New York City. He basically said, uh, uh, it was their land and we took it. Why would they have any agreement with me? Why would they have any uh uh, approval of what did what we did. He's very candid. Uh, out of coming out of the Holocaust, he was not in the mood to to deal with the the rights of indigenous people in Palestine. But you know, if you are arguing the case today, you should lead with that paragraph by Ben Gurion, and then and then have the uh, Israel can do no wrong crowd in Congress rebut Ben Gurion, and not only that. But not only that, but, but, but even more current, Netanyahu is quoted 
repeatedly in Israeli press like Haaretz uh, of saying in the past that he supports and funds Hamas because that's the way to break up the Palestinian coalition with the Palestinian yep. Authority for a two-state solution. Yep. And, and, it, and that was quoted in the New York Times recently, that yep. he basically said, we support and fund Hamas because that's the way we can block a two-state solution. Yep. And, and then he ends with the words, that's our strategy. And he said that to his own Likud party. I mean, what more evidence do you want of what's right. going on over there? Right. I mean, the, the exact David Ben-Gurion quote, and I know this because it was included in the most recent uh, edition of Capitol Hill Citizen on the first page, on the front cover. If I were an Arab leader, I would never sign an agreement with Israel. It's normal. We have taken their country. Uh, it is true. God promised it to us. But how could that interest them? Our God is not theirs. There has been anti-Semitism, the Nazis, Hitler, Auschwitz. But was that their fault? They could see but one thing. We have come and stolen their country. Why would they accept that? So another endorsement of going ahead and getting uh, a subscription to the Capitol Hill Citizen, or at least buying copies as you can. Thank you so, so much for joining me again here today, Ralph Nader. It's a real pleasure. And thank you, Brianna, for all your work to educate the public and to keep the spirit of free discussion robust and alive without censorship. Absolutely. I really I really do appreciate um, being in dialogue with you. I hope to get you back on the show soon. And thank you to all the listeners for tuning in to this episode of Bad Faith Podcast. You know you can get an additional episode every week by subscribing at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast and catch free episodes and clips over on Bad Faith YouTube. Go ahead and subscribe there and so you don't miss notifications about new drops. Thank you again. Take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.